Amen. We're going to dismiss our youngsters, uh, 12 years of age and under, can head down to Children's Church if they'd like to at this time. Lord bless them as they do go. We can take our Bibles, the rest of us, and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to look at the first 10 verses of Scripture here this morning. And uh, as they're beginning to make their way down, it's good to see the Fagwatsi family here this morning. It has been a long time since we've had you back with us here as well. And I must have looked right past you as I was looking back at the Jenkins here, but we're glad to have you here today. I know you made it out uh, in, in the vehicles on occasion when we were outside, but we're glad to have you indoors with us here today and trust the Lord will bless our time together. That would be wonderful. Matthew chapter 28 is the passage of Scripture I trust that you're open to. And like I said, as the Lord leads, we'd like to look at these first uh, 10 verses of Scripture here this morning, dealing with the resurrection of Christ. Let me just uh, give you the highlight of it, and then we're going to kind of take it apart a little bit verse by verse here. But I want you to know this, the resurrection of Christ, I really believe, offers encouragement. I want you to look at verse quickly here, verse 5 and a little bit of verse 6a here. Uh, these are proclamations from the angel, and it's really pretty interesting. I never saw this before in my life, but that's the beauty of God's Word. You can look at a passage of Scripture and just continually learn uh, some wonderful truths. Here's an angel speaking to these women that arrived there in verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. Hey, the encouragement that we have because of the resurrection of Christ is we do not need to fear. And yet the problem is we do fear. And so uh, we need to take a lesson from the, this proclamation of the angel. Fear not. There's great encouragement as a result of the resurrection of Christ. But folks, there's also some, uh, the resurrection offers wonderful evidence. See this in again, the latter part of 6. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, look at this, come see the place where the Lord lay. Here's the evidence. You don't believe me? Hey, you come and see for yourself. Come see the place where he lay. He is no longer here. Uh, we serve a risen Savior. There is incredible evidence that we have that the resurrection is truth. And uh, some of that is the empty tomb. And so that's a great truth. And then lastly, I want us to see here this morning, uh, it's, and it's going to be a while till we get to all these, but is, uh, the resurrection really offers employment. And I, I think of this, just the, just the time that you thought you were unemployed or you retired or something along those lines. No, you know, in the service of the Lord, you're never done. Uh, I was talking to a, an 85-year-old man yesterday down in Florida, a friend of Jack Stiebel, and he was calling to inquire about Jack. He came, couldn't get a hold of him. The, the phone at his house is disconnected because he's moved over to be with his daughter and and so he's calling and calling and finally got a hold of me and we're talking. And this is a man that worked with Jack many years ago. And as the Lord so led, uh, uh, some things happened and there was a transfer in place. And he was heading to Louisiana to take this transfer when, when God really had burdened his heart. Now, God had been working in his heart all along. But this man, at a later, uh, later in life, really wanted to go to Bible college and, and use his life to, to minister the Word of God to people. And so uh, he, he declined the transfer, uh, went to Bible school, and uh, has been using the Lord, uh, or using his time for serving the Lord by way of an internet ministry. Uh, he's, there's all different kind of ways you can serve the Lord, folks. You don't have to stand in a pulpit to serve the Lord. There's lots of different ways. But uh, the, the long and short of that, I said, are, uh, are you still serving the Lord? He said, well, how can you not? I mean, you know, as a Christian, we are continually employed in the service of the greatest employer of all of eternity. It's the king of the kings. And uh, when, he, when he, you got saved, he gave you a job to do, and that job isn't over until he takes your last breath. And so here's what the job is. Here's the employment of these ladies. It's found in verse 7. It is, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. The resurrection offers encouragement, evidence, and employment. And these are three proclamations that come from the lips of an angel to these women. And we can learn something from them here this morning. Let's ask God's blessing on the ministry of his word. And then we're going to take up the text that's before us. Father, we are a blessed people. Uh, Lord, we, we sit here uh, today on resurrection ground. Uh, Lord, this is something that's special for us. Uh, living in the air, the dispensation, the, the time in which we live. This is the church age. This is, this is the, the victorious age, Lord, as far as uh, the Messiah has come. And he's paid the sin debt in full. 
and uh, rose again victorious over sin and Satan and death. And now he is seated at your right hand and he ever lives to make intercession for us. Uh, Father, we are so grateful uh, to be called your children and to have that confident assurance uh, that our Savior is alive and well. And as a result of it, we will spend all of eternity with him and with you, with the Holy Spirit, with the saints of old. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, this day will never grow old. May it always be an exciting day. May we live in the resurrection power day in and day out. May you get much glory from our lives. And Lord, for these things, we want to thank you. We're going to thank you in advance for what you're going to do even here today. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a lot of truth contained in this. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit till we get to verse uh, 4 and 5. But uh, I want you to walk with me here through this passage of Scripture here, dealing with the resurrection of Christ. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. In the end of the Sabbath, uh, this, this, I think, really has an unfortunate translation in, in other Bibles, other translations. Sometimes they will translate it late on the Sabbath. But there's really something really good for us to look here at what, the way it is recorded uh, here in our King James Bible. In the end of the Sabbath. I think John Phillips said it the best. He said the, the KJV is eloquent, it is profound, it is a startling commentary on a change in the national order of things. In the end of the Sabbath, folks, when this day took place uh, here on Resurrection Sunday here, what Christ was saying was Judaism is finished. Judaism is over. The Sabbath is done with. We are on new ground here. This is the first day of the week. This is resurrection ground. And so he is really in essence saying the Sabbath has come to a completion. The Jewish Sabbath was rendered obsolete by the Lord's resurrection just as the temple was made obsolete with that tearing of the veil. When that veil was torn, now man, all of man, Jew and Gentile, you didn't have to be a high priest, you didn't have to be a priest, all of mankind could now make an approach to the holy God of heaven. There was no longer a division between the holy place and the holy of holies. All of man now had access to the presence of God. And it ended something there. So, so that tearing of the veil was a significant uh, passage of scripture inviting all of mankind to come into the presence of the Lord. And, and, and all of that is wrapped up even in these little words in the end of the Sabbath. Judaism was really dealt a, a death knell, as it were, when it came to this event. It was on the Sabbath that the Lord of life and glory, the incarnate creator of the universe, the Lord of Sabbath, lay silently and still in death. Now, I want you to think about that. Because it was Friday, and Sunday was coming. And there he was on the Sabbath, laying still and silent in death. The Sabbath, the Sabbath was rooted and grounded in law. But law could not save. Law, law had at best been a schoolmaster to point people to the coming Messiah. And folks, he has now come. And he, and he came with a mission, and he accomplished his mission. And it's as if the fathers gave his stamp of approval when Christ came out of that tomb. I am well pleased with this sacrifice of my son here. And so Christ made under the law, came to redeem us from the law, and he did just that. And that's why, again, these little words in the end of the Sabbath, as John Phillips says, are eloquent, profound, and a startling commentary on a change in the national order of things. So this is where I, I hope to do time and again by way of preaching, and, and I'm not even to my point yet, but I want you to always understand this. Every word is given by inspiration of God. Every word has significance and importance. And that's why I say I hope, and, and if you're anything like me, sometimes we just kind of gloss over because maybe we're reading for a particular purpose. We're reading to maybe get through the chapter or learn something else. And, and so we gloss over so much. But there is so much if we would just slow down sometimes. And that's good advice for myself. And just camp on certain words. This in the end of the Sabbath is really a significant teaching. It goes on, it says here, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. 
It's the dawning of a new day. We talked about this morning uh, in our outdoor service. It was the dawning of a new day. And, and boy, uh, this new day, again, has already brought hope and, and, uh, and brought warmth to this new day, even as we were sitting out there. The birth of the church is only 50 days away, folks. The church has not been brought into existence yet. This is Resurrection Day here. 50 days from now will come the birth of the church. And uh, listen, there will be a turning from the Sabbath to the first day of the week. That's why we worship on Sunday. This, again, is the first day of the week. This is the day that, that Christ came out of the tomb. He is the, he is the first fruits. Uh, you see the pattern laid out clearly in the New Testament church meeting on the first day of the week. The Sabbath has come to an end. It's the dawning of a new day. It is the first day of the week. Very significant. The tomb was the grave of all hopes. It contained the mortal remains of one whose life and love had conquered their hearts. They expected nothing else. In sorrow, these ladies come to the sepulcher. They come to see a tomb filled with a body. And instead, they see a Savior who has risen. They don't see it in these couple verses, but they will see him. These ladies will be the privileged individuals to first see the resurrected Christ. And what, again, a glorious experience. Several women, a couple of them are mentioned here. Mary Magdalene. Uh, the one who had seven demons cast out of her. Mary Magdalene became a new creation. She understood who Christ is, and she never forgot it. These are the same women, by the way, who were there at the foot of the cross when Christ gave up his last breath. These are the first women to come to the tomb. They are eternally grateful for the work that Jesus has done for them. Hey, folks, I sure hope that you and I will demonstrate, again, that same kind of gratitude for our Savior and all that he has done for us. Oh, listen, we weren't there literally at that, to, uh, at that cross, but I believe that we were there on the mind and heart of Christ. He knew that we would be born someday, and he was dying in our place that day. These ladies, uh, Scripture would tell us that there were other women that, that had joined. One here is mentioned, Mary. This is the other Mary. This is the mother of James. Uh, the son of Alphaeus, this is one of the other apostles. There were two Jameses. One was James, the brother of John, and then there's James, the son of Alphaeus. And James's mother was this other Mary. Salome was there. That's the mother of James and John. There were other women there. So there were a number of women. But when I read that, I don't know about you, but I always get a little convicted. Where were the men? Where were the men? Can I ask you this? Where are the men? Where are the men today? The women continue to lead the way. I will say, I take my hat off to ladies. Ladies are tender. They are sensitive. They have a heart that is huge. They want to live for God. They want to serve God. We just need more men like that. We need more men that have a heart and a desire to serve God. And again, men that are willing to step up. Would to God that the disciples had been the first ones that ran to this tomb that day. But they are absent here, at least early on. They'll show up in a few minutes after they're sent back with a message from Christ or the angel to go tell the disciples. Then these guys will start showing up. Can I just say, and I know that this is a tangent. I know it is, but I, it really is kind of a, it's a nerve with me. Uh, I would hope that, that, that we as men would give the direction to the, our wives and to our women that they desperately need, not our women giving our direction to us. I think there's something inverted there. We need more men that, that catch the vision and the heartbeat of God and want to, again, be the, the man of God and lead their family on the high ground. God, we need men like that. We really do. And, and, and I, I wish this narrative, and yet all four Gospels will tell us all about these wonderful women. And they are grateful. They're very faithful women. Uh, these are women, again, that were will, willing to, again, risk their all, as it were. And I often wonder sometimes about that. Why were the women? Why, why, did, why did God use shepherds? Why did God use women uh, in a number of different narratives? And you'll see some of that. Uh, somebody has surmised maybe it's because God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And women back in this day were not revered. as They, they weren't given the same status of, as men. Uh, you know, men were everything, and women were almost like second class. And, uh, and I will tell you again there, you talk about another tangent, Christianity has done more to elevate the status of womanhood than any other religion on the planet Earth. Christianity recognizes the value of women. 
and, and, we, and we take our hats off to them, and, and we treat them as women with dignity and respect that they're, again, deserving of. But back in those days, they weren't. And so God is going to use women, again. He's going to use shepherds at the birth of Christ and women here at the resurrection of Christ to, again, confound those that are mighty. The Bible goes on and says this in verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. This is interesting. A great earthquake. Again, I, I never saw this before. But do you remember just three short days ago, prior to this event, there was another earthquake that took place. That was at the death of Christ. Again, the earth shuddered at, at the, the creator God dying for the sin of mankind. An incredible earthquake. And it was during that time again, I believe even that centurion, that Roman guard, with, with authority and power, began to put it all together. And here this unsaved man recognized that that one that was dying on the cross is truly the Son of God. That earthquake, again, incredible. Saying something very easily that could have been noticed by all present. Something unique is taking place here. And then, and then, just three days later, as the women were showing up, maybe they were still running. I, I don't know. Uh, all I know is there was this earthquake. And the Bible goes on and says here in this text, the angel Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone. Maybe it was the rumbling of that stone, pulling that stone. Down. I don't know, but it was an earthquake. Can you imagine if you were one of the ladies on your way to the tomb? Or maybe you had just arrived and all of a sudden the earth is, is shaking under your feet. And, and all of a sudden maybe, maybe they saw the tomb being rolled back. They do see an angel that's sitting there. And this angel is going to converse with these people. It's going to be a pretty incredible sight. So to compare the two earthquakes, three days before and then the earthquake on this day. Somebody has said this, the ground shook with palsy when its creator died. But it shook with pleasure when he rose again. The ground convulsed when Jesus descended into the underworld. With his pierced feet, Jesus marked, marched resolutely into Hades and then out again, causing the bedrock granite of the earth to tremble like a bowl of jelly beneath his tread. Think about that, folks. That's our God. That's our Savior. When he walks, the earth trembles. Would to God that we have that same kind of fear and, and respect, a holy reverential respect for who God is. This is the living Savior that we came to worship today. Somebody else said the deep murmur and the hollow sound which came from beneath the earth gave notice at one blast to heaven and to hell and to all of Judea that the Son of God at that instant did break the gates of brass and smite the bars of death in asunder. I want to tell you, that was an incredible event going on. The anger of the Lord did roar out against those Jews who thought they had prevailed against Christ by putting him to death. Oh, it roared against Pilate who put his seal to this conspiracy. And even more so, it roared against those soldiers that were given a charge to, to protect that tomb. I want you to think about that. Can you imagine what was going on in the minds of people? Something unusual is happening in Jerusalem. Did we not just experience an incredible earthquake three days ago? And here we are, another one? Something is taking place here. Yes, something is taking place. The Creator God is coming out of that tomb victorious. The Bible goes on and tells us here, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. This angel of the Lord descends from heaven. And I want you to think about it. Now, there's other texts that tell us that there was more than one angel, and we don't disagree with that at all. But this one focus here, at least by way of Matthew, is to focus on one angel. And this angel in blatant disregard and majestic disdain for the Roman guard, the governor's imperial seal, and the religious establishment. This grave, he is in essence saying, cannot contain the one who was buried here. This angel is in essence saying, let Jerusalem and Rome just try to interfere, but it will be uh, pointless. What did the angel care about the Sanhedrin or the might of the governor? Hey, this angel had, had understood a few things. 
There was one angel in history past, back in the book of 2 Corinthians. One angel, one night, destroyed an army of 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Hey, listen, the power and might of an angel? This angel sits on the stone and says, what is Jerusalem? What is Pilate? This grave cannot contain this man in here. This very well could have been one of the angels that was referred to by way of the 12 legions of angels uh, back in the previous chapter, Matthew chapter 12. One of those that, again, that had the privilege of coming. Remember those 12 legions? Christ is dying, and it says that he, he, he certainly could have summoned. He could have summoned 12,000 legions. And remember what a legion is. A legion is a significant number within the Roman army. Uh, it's, it, it contained about some 6,000 soldiers. 12,000 legions. Christ could have called whoever he wanted. He is God. And yet he died. As that songwriter said, he died there alone for you and me. He died. But this could have been one of those angels. And he's coming back and he's sitting on the stone. And it's as if to say, like, who's going to interfere now? I got something to show you, world. I got something to show you. And he's going to reveal an incredible sight. No power on earth could roll back that stone in order to close the tomb again. No Jewish Sanhedrin or Roman sovereign could again uh, rewrap the empty grave clothes around that incarnate clay that linen had bound him a few days ago. Think about that. Here he is bound in linen, and he comes out of that. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Almost as if to just leave this cocoon of this, this, this shell behind. Nobody had to come in and unwrap him. He's God. He can do whatever. And out of this, uh, this uh, linen clothing, he comes. Well, the Bible says his countenance was like lightning, talking about the angel, and his raiment white as snow. That had to be a fearful sight. Again, it's not every day that these angels, uh, these women got to see angels. Uh, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. You're not going to get to see angels like this on a regular basis. Folks, you and I have never been privileged to see an angel to this degree. But here he is. His countenance was like lightning. His raiment was white as snow. And the Bible says, And for fear of him, uh, the, the fear of this angel, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. You know, it's going to be interesting. They will, they will fear, as will the women fear, but the soldiers are going to become as dead men, and the women will be there to hear it all, take it all in, and then rejoice in the news that is pronounced. The idea that they became as dead men, they fainted. They were paralyzed with fear. They became unconscious. They were traumatized by what they had seen, and understandably so. And listen, in the back of their mind, they're probably thinking as well, it's a Roman soldier. My charge was to guard this tomb. Nobody in and nobody out. And if anything changes, my life is on the line. And surely that would be the concern of a soldier. But I think the whole scenario, being on guard, be they asleep, be they awake, that earthquake woke them up. That stone rolling back, that angel in that incredible appearance, countenance, white as snow, all of that made these soldiers shake. In fact, it's interesting. This word here in verse 4, and for fear of him the keepers did shake, it's the same root word for earthquake in verse 2. I want you to know, they were trembling. This wasn't just like a little fear. They were trembling as if an earthquake had just taken place. Same root word. Kind of tells you the intensity of what was going on this particular morning. And with that, we come to verse 5, where the angel begins to speak. And the angel has these three expressions, three, three sayings. They're not all commands. Uh, the last one is a command, but they're certainly worthy of our consideration. As the angel says, beginning in verse 5, The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. It's a word of encouragement. Here the angels are now going to encourage these ladies. Hey, ladies, stop fearing. Stop fearing. Fear not. Hey, listen, I see what happened to those guys. I don't want the same thing to happen to you. Fear not. I know what you're doing. I know why you're here. You came because of Jesus, the one that was crucified. It's interesting that angels speak on a number of occasions. I want you to remember, just 33 years prior to this, the angel spoke 
when Christ came down from above. In Luke chapter 2, we're very familiar with this because we've heard many Christmas messages on it. The angel said unto the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Think of that proclamation to the shepherds. Think again what was going on in their mind. But here we are now, uh, years later, 33 years later. And now we have uh, one coming up from the grave. We have one that's, again, raised up from the grave. And the angels, again, are going to speak. And they have three things to say. Fear not, come and see, go quickly. The angels just kind of got lost in angels for a little bit. They are intensely interested in the process of redemption because their beloved is involved in it from beginning to end. Now, I want you to understand this. There are good angels and there are bad angels. We call them the fallen angels. And those fallen angels fell when Satan fell. When Lucifer rebelled against God, was cast out of the heavens, there's a third of the angels that went with him. When Christ died on the cross, he didn't die for the fallen angels. Uh, he didn't die for any angels. He didn't die for the animal world. He died for man. He died for man alone. But these angels have been following this, this story for now six, well, 4,000 years up to this point in time. For 4,000 years, he had been prophesied he was coming, and, uh, and he saw God work in all kind of miraculous ways over the course of those 4,000 years. But now the time has come. And the angels are dispatching it. Hey, angels, I, I got another job for you. I want you to go down there. Roll back that, st that tombstone there. I have a message for the ladies, and you're going to be the messengers. The, an angel, the angel's announcement was light in the darkness. It was life from the dead. It was hope for the hopeless. It was the assurance of salvation. The encouragement, fear not. Fear not. You know, fear is written all over this text here. It shows up at least four times in verse 4, where we read, fear not, or, and, for, and for fear the, uh, of him, the, the angel, the keepers did shake. It shows up again in verse 5, where the proclamation of the angels is, fear not. You'll see it again in verse 8, where the Bible says, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. We'll come back to that in a little bit here. And then you'll see it again in verse 10, where uh, they said, Jesus... Uh, then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Fear is written all over this text. It is here that we need to just pause and kind of reflect and think on a few things. I find it somewhat remarkable, and yet I ought not, because I'm made of the same material that these ladies and these men are made of. Why were they so fearful? Well, let's, let's be real. I've never really experienced an earthquake. I think we had one or two of them around here, but, but uh, I didn't really know about it until after it happened, I think. Or there might be a little rumble or something like that, and then you read about it later or hear about it on the news that there was an earthquake. But living as close as we do to the quarry, I'm not sure if they're blasting down there or what it is, but, but I've never been in the middle of a real earthquake. I'm glad I don't live out in California somewhere. And uh, I, I'm glad that I don't see buildings come tumbling down. And there's been some pretty massive earthquakes all around the world and a lot of devastation. So, uh, so an earthquake, to be honest, that might put a little bit of fear in me. You know, I, I might put a little bit of fear in me. Uh, an angel? Uh, I can't imagine. I guess maybe my imagination isn't that great. I just don't plan to see an angel anytime soon. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the Savior. Uh, but if an angel showed up between here and there, that'd be pretty incredible, but I'm not anticipating him to show up, but I don't think these ladies were either. But I think the whole scenario is really what brought fear to these people. The whole scenario. Yes, the earthquake, the stone rolled back, the angel sitting there, and these words. But what were these ladies coming to do? They were coming to anoint a dead person's body. Had they not remembered, did nothing register in their minds or in the minds of the disciples who had the privilege of traveling with Christ for years, of listening to his words, of listening to him prophesy on many occasions. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to rise again. Was that, was that just information that just kind of went right over their head? 
Did they, did they not ever stop to rise again? Hey, they were even privileged to see this Savior raise people back from the dead. You, you would have thought that that might have invoked some kind of question and answer time with Christ. What do you really mean? I understand death. You're going to die. Peter didn't want that to happen. We know he addressed that. But rise again. Folks, these women, these men, and I'm going to put ourselves in the same category, are sometimes oblivious to the truths of God's word. And, and, and I think therein lies something that, that, that creates a fear in our lives. It's almost as if sometimes we just, we just really don't believe some of the truths that we read. And I say that kindly because I'm in that same category. Like, do we really believe that Christ could return today? I do. I hope you do as well. Now, all of us would give mental assent. Of course we do because we know that's are you, are you anticipating it? Are you excited about it? And if it were to happen today, would you be in shock and awe, even though it has been spoken over and over again? You see, the danger, folks, is we kind of fall into a trap. These words, yes, we know, but do we really? Are we really believing those things? This is addressed. An angel speaking in another gospel, Luke chapter 24, says this. As they, these women, were afraid and bowed their face to the earth and said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Now listen, here's these words right out of Scripture. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And only when they were face to face with that truth, the Bible says the very next verse, and they remembered his words. But folks, that's us. You know, it's like if the rapture were to occur, we would probably be in shock and awe. And then it's like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. I do remember that. I, I remember he did say he was gonna, he's going to come back. Here's my point. I think there would be less fear in the life of a Christian if we really took God serious. I really think there'd be less fear in our lives if we really believed the Word of God. Let me give you a couple examples, because that sounds like so general. Do you fear death? I would hope not a one of us, not a one of us sitting here today would fear death. Hey, if, if we got the notice that uh, you have less than 24 hours to live, I, I'd certainly want to be saying my goodbyes to my folks, but I am not fearing death, folks. I'm not fearing death. You know why? Because there is one who came to disarm death of its sting. This one came to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to rob the grave of its terror. This one came to destroy the dominion of Satan. This is the resurrected Christ that offers us hope beyond the grave. So why would I fear death? Do you know there are a lot of Christians that fear death? Now listen, I'm not saying we're, wel we're, we're welcoming death or we're looking forward to death or we're hastening the day to get to death. I'm not saying any of that. But I am saying when death comes our way, what do we have to fear? Do you really believe that there is life beyond the grave? Do you really believe that Christ is longing for you to come into his presence? Do you really believe you're, there's a place called heaven? Do you really believe that? If so, then death, death doesn't scare you one bit. It really doesn't. I'm not saying you live your life in a foolish manner to, again, bring on an early death. You don't do any of that. But listen, when that death knell comes, no fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Hey, listen, do you fear sickness, suffering, persecution, the uncertainties of life? Now, listen, I know that we all have our anxious moments. We all do, huh? myself included. Don't stand before you as like, oh, I'm... I'm above all this. No, no, listen, there's a lot of uncertainties. We, we don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but I'm happy I know who holds tomorrow. And therein lies my confidence that I don't have to fear about tomorrow. I really don't fear tomorrow. I don't fear next week, next year. Has not God already addressed all of these issues, all of these issues in his holy word? And the answer to that is yes. God has addressed it all. And again, taking a context, uh, taking a, a scripture fr from its context, uh, I really believe that there could be application. Pastor Josh made reference to this the other night, but I already had it in my notes. 
Where again, the invitation has come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I understand the context there is dealing with the spiritual bankruptcy and the things that are going on within Jerusalem and the Judeo system. But hey, listen, I really believe that Christ is inviting his people to trust him, rest in him. He, he is our new Sabbath. Our Sabbath is no longer found in the day. It's in a person. It's in the person of Christ who got victory over the law and all that's contained therein. Grant you again, I haven't seen an earthquake to this magnitude. I dare say I probably would have some, some concern, maybe, but fear. I praise God for the tranquility he offers, not the tranquilizers that, that man offers. Uh, there's peace in Christ in knowing that. Those that seek Christ shall rejoice, for in the seeking they shall find. And in the finding they find everything in him. We are complete in Christ. And therefore, I would hope that, that it would never have to be said about us, fear not. Why? Because our confidence is in the Lord and in his word and the truths that he has taught, taught us. And so we can live victorious lives over this element of fear. I want you to see as well the resurrection of Christ offers plenty of evidence. Plenty of evidence. Uh, the, the text would go on and tell us here, the latter part of verse 6, First part says, he is not here for he is risen as he said. Here comes the evidence. The angel now invites these women. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. The greatest apologetic, the greatest defense of the resurrection is the empty tomb. This truth, as has been pointed out, separates Christianity from all other world religions. I want you to think about that, folks. Not just other world religions, but others that would even want to come under the guise of Christianity. It was funny the other day. I was uh, I was in my I was at my mother's house this past week, and and uh, just to, trying to uh, be an encouragement to her in these days. And and I'm sitting in a room because she uh, she's a slow mover in the morning. So she gets out of bed. She loves her rocking chair with a heating blanket already around her, and the house is already 78 degrees. And and she's saying, I'm cold. And it's like, Mom, we're plenty warm. But So we're sitting there, and we have lovely chats, and she gets her breakfast there, and we just have a wonderful time. Well, sitting there, I noticed some dust on the, the dresser. I don't know about you, but I told you I'm kind of a clean freak in a lot of ways. I really am strange. Uh, I don't like dirt and dust and things of that sort. So I thought, well, hey, I'm just standing here talking or sitting here talking with Mom. I might as well find a duster and start dusting while I'm talking. So I got a duster and started dusting all the, the dresser and the bed and all this kind of stuff. And then I came over to the dresser, and uh, right above one of the dressers is a crucifix. Now, you know there's a difference between a crucifix and a cross. Crucifix still has Christ on it. Our crosses do not have Christ on it. And she said, could you fix the palm that's underneath the cross, the crucifix? They call it a crucifix. They don't call it a cross. And uh, because my sister was there on Palm Sunday, and they bring palm, and they put it behind their crosses, and my sister put it apparently in backwards or upside down. I don't know how, I didn't know there was a front and backwards. I didn't know there was directions with this. But to my mom, it was not the right way. Mom, I'll, I'll be glad to move it for you. Well, that was a procedure. So I'm taking the crucifix off and grabbing the palm, and the palm was already nailed to the, the wall behind the crucifix. And, and as I took the cross off, it slides up because they put like anointing oil on the inside of these crucifixes. And that's for the sacrament of last rites. When a person's ready to die, a priest will come. He'll take that holy oil and he'll sprinkle your body and say a prayer. And, and that helps you to get to heaven, I guess. I'm not quite sure. But it was empty inside. And then I started playing with my mom. I said, hey, mom, I, I kind of like this without this. Look at this. There's no body on the cross here. Don't you like that? No, no. You've got to put the body back on there. And it just slides right back on there. But, but I kept saying, mom, th there's a real difference. We're, ha we're having fun. And you can do this with mom. She's, she's good. She's a good sport about all this stuff. But I also see it as a, a, a subliminal message as well. There's a, there's a message that I'm trying to say. Hey, mom, our cross doesn't have a body on it. He's no longer on the cross. He did that. He died. Died once for the sins of man. He came off that cross. He went into a tomb, but, but the tomb is still empty. He's alive, mom. He's well. When I look at a cross... I remember what Christ did for me, but I also know where he is as we speak. You know, the earth is full of tombs, but there is no tomb in heaven. And there is no silent tomb in hell. 
The day is coming when every grave will be emptied. And we made mention of that this morning down at the property. Somebody has said this, sin dug for death all his graves. Sin dug for death all his graves. Sin had slain the beloved Lord. He willingly laid down his life because of sin. But on this day, something most unusual happened. He came out of that grave. He came out of that tomb and lives forever for us today. Hey, come see the place where he lay. What an invitation to offer unsaved friends. Go to Jerusalem if you want to. And they have a place where they believe that he was buried. But I guarantee you that tomb is empty. And therein lies the greatest evidence, the greatest evidence that we serve a risen Savior. Do you know with the grave, there seems to be a fascination, a strange fascination with cemeteries and graves. Have you ever been to a grave where somebody is visiting their loved one, their spouse, their parent, and they talk to that person as if that person is inside of that tomb? Folks, I assure you, that person is not inside the tomb. There may be a body inside of that tomb, but that person is alive. That person is alive and in one of two places, heaven or hell. They're the only two places. That body will come out of that tomb, but that person is not in there. That person is long gone. A body, the remnants of that person is in there, but that person is long gone. That person is in heaven or in hell. This fascination that we sometimes have with that, as if, again, that vault contains, still has that body, and I can talk to that individual. It's really kind of a sad commentary. And I would hope, men, again, there would be an opportunity for you and I to capitalize as we're witnessing to people that, hey, loved one, in this case, my mom, because we do go out to visit a cemetery where my father is buried, and she does talk to my father. Hey, mom. Jesus is alive and well. Uh, when we die, we immediately ascend into the presence of God or descend into the presence of hell. Mom, there's nobody in there. Now, that's, that's you, you got to handle that with kid gloves. You got, I, I understand that. I understand that. That's her life, her love. Married 50 some years. But, folks, there's nobody inside of those things. What is it, the fascination that we have with graves? Here's the good news. The good news is there's hope beyond that grave. And that living hope that we have is, again, rooted in Christ. I wish I had time to share a story, but I'll never get through the third point. But I want you to understand that there's other resurrection evidences, uh, certainly the empty tomb, the greatest. The, the grave closed in one, in one place, uh, one piece here. Uh, again, you could read about this in other texts. It was almost, again, like a, like a cocoon. Like, like the body just simply rose out of those grave clothes. They were all intact. Even the napkin was in its place. You know, I've shared with you before some fascinations about the napkin. You know, they tell you when you have proper dinners, if you ever have a proper meal and you go to somewhere and there's a napkin there and you take the napkin and put it on your lap and you begin to dine. And you know how you know when the meal is over? When you take the napkin, you fold the napkin and put it on the plate. Or you put it on the table. That's signifying the meal is complete. And until then, the, lap stays in, the, the napkin stays in your lap. Hey, folks, the napkin was put in its place. It is over. It is finished. Victory has been gained by this Savior that lives here. I ask the question, what personal evidences do you have that you serve a risen Savior? Oh, I know. You can't go back 2,000 years ago. You didn't see what these ladies saw. But what evidence do you have that Jesus is alive? I asked that question this morning when we sang the song. He is risen. Uh, he is alive. How do you know that? He lives within my heart, the songwriter said. There's truth to that. Have you personally witnessed God at work in and through your life? I hope so. I hope there's a lot of evidence. I hope it's written all over your life. I hope when somebody sees you, they see that you're somebody different. Evidence, again, of God at work. Do you have the promises of Scripture ingrained in your heart, not just your mind, but you're truly trusting in them? Do you really believe the book and all, again, the things that God has said? All of that, again, will keep you away from fear and also, again, convince the unbeliever about a risen Savior. Hey, hardened unbelievers, those who choose not to believe, 
That's their own doing. They will often go away from a, an encounter with the Word of God, maybe in rage, maybe they'll even make up stories, much like they're going to do with this whole story. But they remain an unbeliever, not because they cannot believe, but because they will not believe. Opportunities afford man to believe on Christ and be gloriously saved. Hey, folks, quickly, last point. The resurrection of Christ not only offers encouragement and evidence, but here's the employment. Here's your job, folks. This is the command again. Look at verse 7. And go quickly and tell the disciples. Go quickly and tell the disciples. We have a job to do, and this job has not yet been rescinded. This job is, again, this commission was given to ladies 2,000 years ago. Christ also gave it to his disciples 2,000 years ago, uh, shortly after this particular scene. And this is a commission that still stands in existence. Go and tell. Go quickly. Don't even just, don't linger. Don't think about it. Just go quickly and tell others. The vacated sepulcher became the cornerstone of apostolic preaching. Study the preaching of Peter, Paul, uh, these disciples, folks, if, if you just stay with the cross, if you just stay with the death of Christ and never get to the, resurre the resurrection of Christ, you have given them an incomplete gospel. There's not a lot of good news in the death of Christ. There's good news that he died for your sins, but hey, he was raised again to new life. And therein lies the complete gospel and the good news. This was the message that was proclaimed by uh, P uh, Paul. And uh, it's one that ought to echo from our lips. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Again, note Paul including this in the gospel here. The young church invited Jew and Gentile, Greek and barbarian, bond and free, rich and poor, great and small, to ponder again the resurrection of Christ. And upon pondering it, now go and tell somebody. Hey, here's a challenge for you today. Will you talk to somebody about the resurrected Christ? Hey, listen, it can be your family member. It can be another Christian. But will you, from your own lips, talk to somebody about a risen Savior? You know, you may see some people and you might say, Happy Easter, but Easter doesn't cut it, folks. Get to the real deal. Get to the real deal. Hey, listen, Happy Resurrection Sunday if you want to. Let me tell you about my Savior. He's alive and well today. Don't keep it to yourselves. The first proclamation was made to shepherds, the second ladies to ladies. And uh, we're grateful that these challenges were given for us. They departed quickly, the Bible says in verse 8. Uh, they went and told the disciples they were obedient to the command of this angel. And uh, lo and behold, I really believe that God will reward them for their obedience because he will uh, catch up with them. Uh, in the process of telling the disciples, the Bible says in verse 9 that Jesus met them saying, All hail. And that's certainly a greeting of rejoice. Uh, they came held him by the feet, and worshiped him. And then Jesus says, hey, listen, be not afraid, go tell. And, uh, and they go off again with joy in their heart. Hey, folks, uh, we have a job to do. The resurrection offers employment. Re-up. Uh, sign again. Maybe, maybe we have been short in, in recognizing our responsibility. May today, again, be a clarion call for us to Certainly rejoice in, in the encouragement that it offers us and the evidence that is clearly written all over Scripture. In addition to the eyewitnesses, there's lots of things we've helped. But it also, also says to the believer, hey, listen, go and tell somebody. Go tell somebody about this truth. The empty tomb put a new conviction in the disciples just as Pentecost put a new courage in the believers. As Christ, up from the grave and a comforter down from glory, gives the church today conviction and courage to stand tall amidst the challenging days in which we live. Aren't you grateful for a resurrected Christ? I am. I'm thankful for all that he offers us, the encouragement, evidence, and yea, even the job that we have to do. May God help us to be faithful about that work today. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us again with another opportunity to come together as your people, worship you on this glorious day. Thank you again for the reminder that you give us in your word about the empty tomb. Lord, all part of your plan. None of this took you by surprise. We're so grateful for this uh, well-thought-out plan that covered all the bases of mankind. And so, Lord, we sit here today rejoicing, knowing that Christ died for us. He became our substitute. He died a cruel death. We saw that here this morning. We were reminded of that truth. But I'm thankful again. He came out of that tomb victorious over death. Yes, Satan has been told 
He's on death row. Sin, again, has no power over us, and yet we succumb to it. We ought not. Thank you for, again, what is offered to us in a resurrected Christ. May we be, again, much like the angels, or much like the women, following the heed or the challenge of these uh, angels, and, yea, even Christ himself, to go and share this good news with people all around us. May you get glory. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, I want to thank you for paying attention here this morning. We're going to close by taking our hymn books, turning to hymn number 427, Go in all the world and uh, share this good news. Let me just say this. It's very possible you're here today, or maybe you're home listening, and we're thankful for both. We're thankful for those that are here and those that are home. Uh, maybe there are some that are listening and watching and say, boy, you know, I, I know Easter is all about resurrection, but but you understand the fullness of, of this. The, the, the Christ who rose from the grave is the same one that died and died in your place and took your sin as the punishment. He took our punishment. And uh, there's only one way now to get into heaven. There's only one way to appease the God of heaven. And it's not by being a good person or even coming to church as good as that is. It's got to be a personal relationship with the God of heaven. I hope and pray all that are within listening ears know that for certain. And if you don't, let this be the Easter that changes all things in your life. Let this be the Easter where, again, you get serious about your understanding of God and his word and what Christ really did for you. Come to Christ today. Get saved today. We would love an opportunity to open up God's word, show you how you can be gloriously saved. And so if that's the need of your hour, please come. For the believer, go quickly. Tell. Tell others about this great event. Let's all stand as we close. Hymn number 427. Go in all the world.